All right, one minute, T minus one minute. Grab your seats, please. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Rockets or Schools 2023. Let's hear it for everybody. All right. Good morning. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, exhibitors. Thank you, our volunteer staff. If anybody has any questions, get lost at Blue Harbor, not sure where you're at. Look for somebody in a red shirt that says Rockets for Schools. We'll get you orientated and off to the right start. So, again, thank you for everybody being here. We have teams from, we'll cover part of this a little bit too, but we got teams from Maryland, Kansas, Michigan, Iowa, Illinois, Wisconsin. It just keeps growing. So, again, thank you, everybody, for being here. Most of all, from all of us, glad to see everybody here. If we could, could everybody please stand up? Look to, look to the east here, to the flag, and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you very much. All right, as I mentioned, we do have 23 teams this year. It's five more than last year. We keep growing. We're coming out of COVID pretty strong. So, again, if you've got friends, relatives, teammates, other schools that uh, want to join and have a great time, please send them our way. Again, we got teams from Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Iowa, Maryland, and Kansas, just to name a few. We have many thanks to go out to the city of Sheboygan. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard's helped us out and our Rockets for Schools Planning Committee. So can our Rockets for Schools Planning Committee, everybody stand up. Barb, I see Brian, Diane's back there. Uh, a couple of them are missing, but anyone with a red shirt, make sure you thank them and let's give them a round of applause for right now. All right, we have our exhibitors here. We've got a great plethora of exhibitors. We've got everything from Spaceport Sheboygan with the space flow and information. We've got e 2 and the Rockets, Green Bay, Lakeshore Technical College. We've got Loke. We've got everybody in the back. Please visit them. They take their time out to be here to help promote the industry of science, technology, and mathematics. So thank you again. Make sure you go up to exhibitors and thank them for their times. Volunteers, we have a bunch of volunteers that are here besides our planning committee that make sure things happen. They're everybody from coordinating all the cats and kittens and chickens and, and everybody into their presentations. We have people managing the rockets tomorrow. We have all that happening. So anytime you see uh, someone in your red shirt, just you know, give them a high five and thank them for being here. Most of all, teachers and mentors, could you stand up please? Teachers and mentors. Teachers and mentors. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> All right, before we get into our formal introductions with the mayor of Sheboygan and with Blue Harbor here, I would like to
build on that team mentor and that notation. I'm going to call your club's name or your school name. I'd like you to stand up and wave to everybody. We have, like I said, 23 teams. Let's get to know each other. That's part of tonight's deal is sit down and talk, have a brat, have a hamburger, some pulled pork, and just talk about what you do for your school, your payloads, your rockets and such. So let's go through the 23 teams. So can I have the Star Splitter 4-H Club stand up and wave to the crowd? So the Star Splitters, there they are. All right, uh, Baker Demonstration Toothpaste Takeoff. Where's Baker Demonstration? All right. One of our new teams, Christian Academy of Louisville, Max Antitude. Show us your team, guys. All right, then we have another new team, Norwood Park Rockets Club, the Anti Graviteers. All right, uh, I would probably say one of our one of our more senior teams, Aaron School, the Aaron Slimers. There they are, right in the back. Another new school, another new team, and hopefully for many years to come, Whitefish Bay Middle School, the Whitefish Bay Crashers. Where are you guys? <laughs> All right, another new team, Norwood Park Rockets Club, the Lemonheads. There they are. They're in the back. Also from Christian Academy of Louisville, the high school team. All right, another new school, Northside Catholic Academy, Wildcat One. There they are. Wave, guys. There you go. Jump up and down. <laughs> All right. We have Woodworth Middle School, BMSA, which I think is Brass Monkey Space Agency, right? <laughs> Whitefish Bay Middle School, Paper Ace. And our last team in class one for the 2023 event is the Kuwaska Middle School Heartbreakers. All right, moving to class two, our more senior teams, a little bit more experienced in high pocket rocketry and have been here probably before or at other events. So our first team is Greenfield High School, Bubbles Over the Moon. I don't think they made it here yet, but they're part of the team. All right, uh, Middleton High School, the Middleton Rocket Club. There they are. All the way from Maryland, Explorer Post 1010, Rocketville Blue Crabs. All right, a little bit up north and to the west, Shawano. Sorry, Shawano. Shawano Community High School Meteorite. Everybody from Wisconsin knows the Shawano thing, or Trivers, if you're from Two Rivers. Um, let's see, Cedar Falls, Cedar Falls, Iowa, Cedar Falls Rocket Club, Joss. <laughs> Madison West. Rockets for Schools, NDVI. All the way from Fort Hayes, Kansas, KMS Rocketry. Kewaskam High School, one of our senior teams, Lightsaver. Madison West High School, Astrobiology. All the way from the southern part of Michigan, Northville High School, NHS Aerospace. There they are. 
And the last team rounding out the 2023 event for Class 2, Shawano Community High School, the Richter Rumble. All right, so what I'd like to do at this time is, you know, we have great support from the city of Sheboygan. They helped provide us and actually helped us with the conference center for many years. They help us out with the police department, the fire department, our barricades, traffic control, and all that. So at this time, I'd like to ask us, our mayor of Sheboygan, Ryan Sorensen, to come up for a few words. All right, good morning everybody. Thank you, Kenny, and welcome everybody once again to Rockets for Schools right here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, or if you're not familiar, we're also known as the Malibu of the Midwest because of all of the that we have to offer right on our beautiful lake shore. So it is a beautiful, bright, warm, sunny day here in Wisconsin once again for out-of-towners. So this is our balmy uh, spring weather in May that we have. So I know all the activities that you'll be doing in this conference center and out in our community that you will hopefully um, enjoy your time here in Sheboygan. But once again, I want to thank, um, first of all, the students for taking the time to be involved not only in the classroom and in your schools, but outside your classroom as well. Getting involved in extracurricular activities is so vital, not only for your personal growth and education, but to be a well-rounded person as well in the future. Your opportunities getting out involved outside of the classroom will better prepare you uh, for the future in your career uh, compared to your peers that aren't necessarily involved in the classroom as well. So stay involved, stay engaged. Um, you'll, you'll find yourself so many opportunities in the future as well. So, um, so since you have the mayor here, we're going to make things official today. Oh, there we go. I got it. All right. So we're going to issue a proclamation here today. So whereas Rockets for Schools provides an opportunity to all students in grades 6 through 12 to learn about aerospace technology, scientific experiments, and space launches, and the stated purpose of Rockets for Schools program is to provide an opportunity for students to participate in aerospace technology and rocket launches, to learn about the rocket construction and launching, and to provide family educational activities. Whereas another goal for Rockets for Schools is to make science exciting and cool to stimulate the academic interest in science, math, and technology, and to encourage students to consider and to pr pursue a future career in aerospace. So now I, Ryan Sorensen, the mayor of Sheboygan, do hereby proclaim this week as Rockets for Schools Week. So Kenny, I'll present you with that proclamation. Thank you. Yes. So. Once again, welcome to Sheboygan. Enjoy your stay here at Blue Harbor and go out and explore a great city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and yes, if you're asking, our mayors are getting younger as we get older. So <laughs> thanks for being here, Ryan. I'd like to invite uh, Delane from Blue Harbor. She has a few words as our host for the conference for everybody. Delane. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you. Hi. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Who's excited to be here? Yes. <laughs> well, we are too. And on behalf of our entire Blue Harbor family, we are so excited to be here. We are honored to have you here and see your work. There are rockets and robots in the corners of these rooms. It's amazing. Um, who else is here in Sheboygan for the first time? Where are you from? Fond du Lac, that's a venture. <laughs> Where are you from? Oh, oh my goodness. Well, I'm from Chicago, Illinois, that foreign place. Yay! <laughs> so a few years ago, I moved here to live on a farm. So I have a very bad joke for you. Why did the cow have to build a rocket? She needed to go to the moon. OK. <laughs> Hey, I tried. So on behalf of our entire team, we are delighted to have you here. Thank you. We wish you every success. So I hope this weekend, if nothing else, make wonderful memories and build amazing rockets. And thanks for being our guest. Thank you, Kenny. All right. Again, thank you, Mayor Sorensen. And thank you, Delane from Blue Harbor for being here today and hosting us. So as we have an event here, you know, we have 23 teams and Three to 400 people here, plus John Q. Public will be joining us. 
We do want to remind everybody about the safety aspects of the event. So again, please always pay attention to ongoing activities, especially tomorrow. We'll have rockets going up. We're going to have roads blocked off. We're going to have John, John Q. Public in here. We're going to be moving around. There's going to be a lot of activities. Just please be safe and always look up and around. In Sheboygan, it was 78 degrees yesterday, sunny and a slight breeze. Tomorrow might be 58 with a breeze off the lake. So please pay attention to the weather, dress accordingly. All teachers and participants, I'd strongly suggest tennis shoes or boots tomorrow um, just because of the activities we're gonna do. So closed toe shoes, pants, sweatshirts would be really good for tomorrow. Um, team advisors, parents, mentors, you are responsible for your team, their actions. Please be aware that your team, where your team is at all times, please. We're all in it together, but we need help to make sure the event handles right. Again, team mentors, safety is the requirement. All rockets tomorrow will be prepared at the RSO table. So those of you that have been here or, or you came in the back doors here, if you look to the right to where the actual pier is, there's a bathroom over there, a, a city bathroom. We usually set up the tables out there for the rockets. But we'll cover that a little bit later today on a separate presentation. Um, the rockets for schools uh, team, our, our volunteers, will actually get the rockets, get them out there so you put your payloads and everything together out at those tables. But again, we'll cover a little bit more later, so if anyone's starting to think or wonder what's gonna happen. Um, again, we are guests of Blue Harbor Resort, City of Sheboygan, the US Army Corps of Engineers, they're the ones that are current, they own the pier, we just get to fly off of it. It is under construction yet, it should be done here by mid-June, and hopefully next year we'll be able to actually have mentors and participants actually take the rockets out to the pads like we did four years ago. So things are around in the corners. We want to thank Michael's construction. Michael's, that whole pier area is an active construction area. Fortunately, we have their permission to access their construction zone um, with limited number of, of qualified personnel. So I'm going to ask everybody here when you go outside and you see the orange fencing, do not cross that orange fencing. That circle roundabout at the very end, Stay out of there. If we catch anybody in there that is part of the event, your team's going home. Okay? That's how strong the safety's got to be. Um, no, again, no one else other than Rocks for School staff is allowed near the orange fenced area. Again, this is not negotiable. Cover today's uh, schedule. So, again, we're in the opening ceremonies right now. At about 1030, we'll have Miss Marsha Ivins, our retired astronaut and keynote speaker, presenting. From 11.45 to, one, it says 1.15 here, it's actually 1 o'clock on your schedule, is lunch. I'd like everybody back here at 1 o'clock in your seats. We start breaking then out for presentations. Once I excuse you at that point, you're welcome to go to the exhibitors, go to your room, walk the, walk the campus area, practice on your presentations. As long as you're back in your seats here by 4.30 to go through all the activities for tomorrow. And then tonight from 5.30 to 9 o'clock is the tailgate. 9 o'clock is probably the longest it would take. We'll probably be done sooner than that. But uh, the food right now is being prepped and ready to go, and we've got a lot of excited people. Okay, a lot of questions on team presentations. Be prepared. Be ready. All of your, all of your team mentors have your schedule. We did have a flip, so nobody freaks out. Um, Woodworth and Christian Academy did a flip to accommodate some students, but we've taken care of that internally, so as you're staging, um, don't panic. For everyone, when you came in the back doors there and you, you came in the door and you went to your right and did your registration off here on the side with Barb in the group, for presentations, you actually go out that door and you go to my right now or your left when we came in. Go down that hallway to the right. Nikki and Jen, can you guys wave at the crew? Those three ladies over there will be your, your Q personnel. They'll make sure the teams are at the right times, where they're going to go, and such. Um, which reminds me, the judges, would you mind standing up here for me? Tiffany and Mike and Max over there. These seven individuals are your judges for today. <laughs> You're going to get to know them really well in five to ten minutes of your life. So just, just to make sure you guys aren't going to try to blow smoke at them, we have a physicist, we have an actuary, we have an environmental science, scientist, we have a chemist, and we have DOT engineers. You're not going to pull the wool over their eyes. So be prepared, 
be ready to go. Some of them have seen him before as their judges, but uh, they're here to play ball with you, and please be ready and do your best. As far as the presentations, you can take your payload with you if you need to. You can also take your display board with you. Sometimes that helps portray what you want to do. We also have a 50-inch Vizio TV, scratch, uh, flat screen there if you need to. Plug in a laptop, we've got an HDMI cord there, and if you're doing a PowerPoint. Just reminder that the entire team needs to participate in your presentation. When you're done with your payload and your display board, make sure it goes back here in the science fair area because the judging on the display boards happens all day long. Um, remember your presentation is five to 10 minutes. You got 15 minutes, but that's for you to transition, get set up, do your presentation, answer questions for the judges, and then depart and queue for the next group. Again, I want to remind everybody that there's only, only the team members and one advisor mentor allowed in there, and there's no recording of the presentations. I know there's a lot of parents that really enjoy to be in the presentations, but given the stress level these kids are already under, the uniqueness of the discussions, we don't want any conflicts or saying he, she, that, or whatever. It takes that out of the equation completely. Every mentor and team advisor I've talked to fully supports that, and we can keep that in place. Just as you're going through your payloads and everything, Tomorrow or even this afternoon, we will weigh your payloads. I mentioned that during the 50 and 90% reviews. We do have our digital scale here. So it's one pound maximum for your class one rockets, two pounds for your class two rockets. So you need to be checked off our list that we've weighed your payload before you're allowed to fly. If there's any concerns, come see me. A uh, reminder that the last step for the Bechtel grants which I want to sidestep one second here. We have 23 teams officially registered, and I discussed further with Battelle, and the entire grant program they gave us was $16,500 to be distributed amongst the teams. So that means besides getting $550, your actual grant for each team that completes everything here this week and then the post uh, launch assessment review will get $700 a team instead of the 550. So make sure everyone participates, do what you want to do. And most of all, thank Patel. Um, we'll send them some great emails, but $700 is a great, great amount of money for the teams. So good job, everybody. Everybody here is qualified for the grants. Everything's been in, turned in. Um, so all we got to do is have fun tomorrow, do your presentations today, and do that one final piece of paperwork. All's good. So. All right, everybody's got their name tag. On their name tags, they should have their name, their team, and then there's a stream and support role. Make sure you understand and talk with your advisor as far as understanding what that is. So for instance, if you are in the Apollo team, you're gonna be prepping your rockets at 11 o'clock tomorrow. And if you're on a Mercury team, you're in support roles. So that means Apollo would be out there getting the rockets together, Mercury, teams, you go to your mission control, to the camera, to tracking, to whatever, to the boat rides, um, you know, just make sure you understand where you're going to go. Now, those that are signed or have the opportunity to go out on the charter boats to retrieve the rockets, if there's an individual that does not want to be on the boat, perfectly fine, you can swap them out with somebody else. But we do have to have one adult along with two kids, okay, two participants. So again, if the adult or participants don't feel comfortable being on the water, they're not going to be forced to go. It's just an opportunity that comes about random. Okay, um, we're going to talk about the passport. Most of you have already started filling out your door prize and your passport booklet. Um, go around to each of the exhibitors. They have a little ink container. They'll mark down that you were there, had a conversation, talked with them. They just will not stamp your passport. You actually have to talk to them. Okay, so engage with them, learn a little bit, share some of your ideas with them. And then when your passport is full and complete, I know there's two free squares in the middle. You don't have to get those stamped. Everything else around it should be in the back room here where they're serving food. There's a long table against the wall with a paper box. Put your, put your completed passports in there because those go in the door prize box, which will put you in the door prize for some, uh, some pa uh, uh, pads, some... Uh, 
Uh, drones. Oh, and make sure you put your name on it too. Thank you, Barb. Yeah, and if you lose it, we'll, if somebody turns it in, we'll get it back to you. Otherwise, work with your mentor to get a, a replacement packet. But we've got a couple drones, a couple uh, uh, Kindle-type devices, jump drives, great door prizes. So it's a, it's a great end of the day. All right, launch support presentations will happen tonight. That'll be with Frank, our range safety officer, which everybody here should know through our 50, 90% reviews. Frank and I talked with you on our rockets. We'll talk about that tonight. Mission control, um, Eric Kainberg will actually be talking about that tomorrow morning um, as he's trying to get out to his son's uh, baseball tournament. We'll talk a little bit about payload tech and again, just weighing, and then we'll talk a little bit about tracking, and then we'll break for the evening. All right, something to know, too, is tonight the, uh, excuse me, the event streaming. The astronaut speaker and Saturday's launch are live streamed on YouTube, so we're all on YouTube right now. Um, you can tell everybody back home your mentors should have gotten an updated strip in their packets with an updated URL for this activity right now and for tomorrow. If worse comes to worse, somebody's not getting a URL, you can take a picture of this one up here and or search for Rockets for Schools live on YouTube. That'll get you to where you need to go, okay? All right, again, Blue Harbors graciously welcome us back this year. Please respect this wonderful uh, facility. Make sure you use the main entrances. Stay in the conference room area during the program. Dispose of your trash. We're all Boy Scouts here. We're gonna be Boy Scouts this weekend. Leave it cleaner than what you found it. And again, I know we've harped on this a lot, but no food brought in from outside vendors. No Starbucks, no ebb and flow from across the street. The reason being is Blue Harbor is hosting us. That's part of the contracting of what we need to do. If you want beverages, there's soda, water, hamburgers, hot dogs, everything in the back corner over here that's for sale by Blue Harbor. However, we do know that teams, you know, if you order from Cousins or Subway or whatever, please enjoy the greenery outside and clean your mess up out there. So we have part of our contracting and and the bottom line is that for every incident that they want to impose on us, it's a $500 incident. So we got four people that get caught, it's $2,000. So um, I don't want to hold back anyone's grant money either. So um, if we can all work together, I'm sure it won't be a problem. But from this point forward, consider yourselves informed. So that includes water, soda, um, anything, coffee. Just let's make sure we hold to that. That will make my life easy. You'll make everyone else's life easier. Any questions? <clears throat> All right, not hearing it at this time. Uh, Ms. Ivins, are you ready? We can get going. So at this time, I'd like to, as, as Ms. Ivins is coming up here, and uh, where's Randy? <laughs> is Randy in the, in the Admiral's room? Okay, just a second. Hold, please.
All right, everybody, thank you for your patience. Uh, actually, we're two minutes early, so we're doing really well. Um, so this is Miss Marshall Evans, our uh, astronaut retired. In 2010, Marshall Evans retired from NASA after a 37-year career as an engineer and an astronaut. After graduating from the University of Colorado with a Bachelor's of Science in Aerospace Engineering, Marshall began her employment with the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas in 1974, working in human factors and machine, excuse me, man-machine engineering on development of orbiter cockpit layouts, displays, controls, and heads-up display. In 1980, Marshall was assigned as a flight engineer on shuttle training aircraft and as a pilot on the NASA administrative aircraft. She holds a multi-engine airline transport pilot license with a Gulfstream 1 type rating, single engine airplane, land, sea, and glider commercial license, and airplane and instrument and glider instructor ratings. She has logged over 7,000 hours in civilian and NASA aircraft. Marsha was selected as an astronaut in the class of 1984 as a mission specialist, a veteran of five space flights, including STS-32 in 1990, STS-46 in 1992, STS-62 in 1994, STS-81 in 1997, and STS-98 in 2001. <laughs> she has logged over 1,318 hours in space. During her tenure in the astronaut office, Marsha supported the space shuttle and space station programs in all areas of operational crew interface, and was the astronaut office expert in flight crew equipment, habitability, imagery, and stowage. In her last four years with the agency, Marsha led the astronaut office, team supporting the Constellation program and the Commercial Crew Development Initiative. Today, Marsha works as an independent engineering consultant. So let's give a big round of applause for Ms. Marsha Ivins. That's good. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and hi. Um, I'm going to, I understand that you've been asked some history questions in, you know, about space. So what I'm going to tell you is the history of human spaceflight. And it starts with this picture. And all of these pictures that I show you, every one of them has been taken by a human being, including this one. So this is, this is the picture of Earth that you would see if you were at the moon. This is not what we see from the space shuttle or the space station, but this is the picture that you see. And the, the story begins in um, basically 1959, 1960, the United States and the Soviet Union were in a race to see who could put the first person into space. The Soviet Union wins this with Yuri Gagarin. In the meantime, our first seven astronauts, they called themselves the Magnificent Seven, mostly in the eye of the beholder, um, are these guys here. And these were the first people that would be actually sent into space. Um, well, actually, the first person that went to space was this guy. So first we sent a monkey, you know, and he's got that same steely-eyed, square-jawed look that you would expect an astronaut to have. What we put our first human in and our first monkey in was this mercury capsule. And so you can see the scale, the people underneath of it. It was not very big. And we were essentially, you know, the um, Alan Shepard, who was the first uh, man to fly in space, he looks pretty much locked in like the monkey did. So it was about the same. And we stuck them on the end of what was a ballistic rocket, a ballistic missile, to try to send them into space. The first two flights were just suborbital. And then we finally sent John Glenn to orbit the Earth. And so this is a picture of John Glenn from his capsule. All of those capsules landed in the water. And then they were, the astronaut was picked up by a, a helicopter and brought back to land again. The second program that we flew was Gemini. That was a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger rocket, a little bit bigger capsule. And we did two things on Gemini as we were prepared to go to the moon. We learned to join two spacecraft together while they're orbiting the Earth and moving at 17,500 miles per hour. So that's a pretty good um, formation flying. And we learned to do a spacewalk. The spacewalks in the early part of the space program, um, you're in that that suit, which is your own private little space capsule. It's got air, pressure, communications keeping you alive, and you're connected by an umbilical, by that cord that you see that goes all the way into the vehicle. This is how much room there was in a Gemini capsule. Gemini was the only one that actually landed intentionally on its side in the water. 
Um, and, and so that's how much room you can see in there. The longest Gemini flight was 14 days. So imagine being like that for 14 days. Then we flew the Saturn V and we started sending people to the moon. Um, and this was the first flight where we sent people around the moon, Apollo 8. And this was the first time anybody had seen Earth from not being on it, the whole Earth. And this was the picture, this was a Christmas flight in December of 1968. And this was a picture that basically changed the way everybody perceived the world. These were the three that we finally sent to land on the moon in this uh, Saturn V rocket. This is what it looked like inside. You can see not much room inside this capsule with the three of them there. And basically, one of them would stay in the command module while the other two went to the surface in the lunar lander. These are real pictures. Here's what it looked like on the surface of the moon. That first, that first flight in Apollo 11 that landed on the moon, they spent 21 hours on the moon, and they maybe walked a mile and a half. That's how far they went in exploring the moon. You can see that the astronaut is standing there, and the, the part that's orange underneath of it was the landing, the descent engine, and that part stayed on the moon, and then the white part on the top was the ascent module, and it, it basically used that orange part as a launch platform. We had five more flights after Apollo 11, and we had a rover, and we could, we could go a little bit farther um, around and, you know, walk around, pick up rocks, but we never really went very far on the moon. Here is that top part, the ascent part, that it's coming back to meet the command module and return to Earth. The Apollo capsule also landed under parachutes, and you can see how burned this capsule looks from having come through the atmosphere. So all of these capsules so far were used one time because of the burning in coming back. The Russians didn't make it to the moon, but they have successfully been flying in space since they launched Yuri Gagarin, and they fly today this rocket called Soyuz, and this is the capsule that they fly. The center part is where the crew is. The ball on the outside is a service module that they, that they cut off before they separate from before they land, and then the main engine and the solar arrays, and this is what it looks like inside today in the Soyuz. So you can see not much different than what it looked like inside the Apollo capsule. They also land under a parachute. This is a real landing. This is actually a safe, good walk away from landing of the Soyuz capsule. They land on land. That's a good landing. Yeah. And here is their capsule, the Soyuz capsule, as it comes back from, from space. And so you can see it is also burned, and they use that one time. And here is recovering the crew in the days of COVID. So the three guys that are in the lawn chairs covered with blankets, those are the crews that have just come back from space station. In 1981, we started flying the space shuttle, and the space shuttle was designed to be reused. It had three main parts, the shuttle orbiter, which is the one with the wings, the orange tank, which held liquid hydrogen and oxygen that fueled the shuttle's three main engines, and the two solid rocket motors on the side. The solid rocket motors were reused. So after two and a half minutes, when they were separated, they burned out and separated, they landed in the water under parachutes, and they were towed back and, and reused again. So we had reusable solid rocket motors, and we, had, we did not reuse the orange tank, which just re-entered the atmosphere and burned up, but we reused the shuttle. So the shuttle was really cool. It was designed to launch like a rocket, fly like an airplane, basically, in space, and then land like an airplane, or fly like a, rock, a capsule in space, and then land like an airplane on a runway at the end of the mission and was reused. And it wasn't burned because all of the material on the outside were individual tiles that rejected the heat. And so they could be you know, refurbished, checked out, and flown again. Um, normally, we would launch in the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and land back there, but if we didn't land there and we landed in California, then they put this, the uh, shuttle orbiter on top of a 747 and flew it back, which was really a miraculous thing to see. 
I show pe people uh, this picture because you think that being an astronaut is a glamorous job, but I show you to remind you that this is the last view anybody sees of you before you get in the capsule. <laughs> Here's what it looked like inside of the shuttle. This is me with the glasses in the, in the forward part of the picture. So we, you can see we had considerably more room because this is where we would live. Inside the shuttle, where the windows are, is the pressurized area, and that's where the crew lived. And then that whole empty part is the cargo bay. And you can see the robot arm on the side there, but that's where we carried um, payloads to space. And does my arrow move around here? Okay, good. And this right here is where we would dock to the space station. We carried a number of payloads in the early days of the shuttle flight. You know, we carried in the cargo bay, picked them up with a robot arm, and put them into space. And probably the most famous of those payloads was the Hubble telescope. And it was designed to be put in space by the shuttle, and then, then the shuttle would fly back up to it again, grab it with the arm, put it back in the cargo bay to do maintenance on it if they needed to. For the last 10 years of its life and uh, 37 flights, we use the shuttle to construct the International Space Station. And this center, this piece right here is a center node. It was connected by the shuttle to the first Russian part. And then I can connect another module here and I can connect modules all on four sides of it. And so over time, we added more parts to it. Um, this is the part I added, the U.S. laboratory module. We added a solar arrays, we added robot arms, we added a truss so that we could move the solar arrays out. We, then we added more solar arrays. We added, um, oh, this is a cool picture. This is the shuttle actually docked to the space station. This is a real picture. How did they take that, you might be asking? Well, the guys in the Soyuz backed away, took a picture, and joined it because what a great picture. But that's, that's a real picture. That one always blows my mind. So now we have modules from all different countries, European, Japanese, um, Russian modules, and this is the way the space station looks today. And since 2001, there has always been a crew on board the space station. Okay, so here's what it's like to, to be in no gravity. All right, first of all, bad hair. And, and just in case you're wondering, here's, here's how that picture was actually taken. <laughs> and no, I didn't leave it down all the time because it would collect things, you know, like food, <laughs> checklists, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Without any gravity, there is no up. Each one of these guys thinks they are up. Um, this is some of the crew that's on board. Four of these guys have come home, but they haven't taken a whole shot. So, so everybody except for four of these guys is the current crew on board space station. Without any gravity, you can lift very heavy objects very easily. And anybody who aspired to do Cirque du Soleil, zero G is your place. Now the thing about gravity without no gravity is that you cannot walk, you have to fly. you don't see them stopping because in order to stop you have to crash into something. So now we know why Superman always flies with his arms out in front of him, right? Um, and actually when you get really good, watch his feet. So the guys that spend a lot of time in space, they, they don't have to fly, they, they're just really good in navigating. You can do some pretty cool things in the absence of gravity. We ask you please to not try this at home. We are trained professionals. That was the commander of my last flight. For every, for every, this is physics, this is a physics lesson. For every force there's an equal and opposite force. And this is me, and notice I don't have to be moving anywhere. Just by moving my body, I can turn completely around. All right, here's the, uh, Here's the uh, example of the ice skater. So he spins him, and when he opens his arms, he slows down, and when he closes his arms, he's, he spins up. And the cool thing about no gravity is that you never get dizzy, and you can spin all day long. 
Okay, now here he's trying to do the same thing that I was doing. Well, no, actually, this is the uh, conservation of angular momentum. And now he's trying to do the same thing as I'm doing. And guys just can't get that hip action going just the, the right way. All right, so you've seen people floating around, but what if you want to stay in one place while you're working? So all over the space station, there are these foot loops, and you can just slide your toes into them, and now you can stay in one place while you're working. Or you can loop your toe around something, and it'll hold you in place also. This is a ball of water. And in the absence of gravity, surface tension is the strongest force there, and it holds the ball of water together. It's a ball of orange juice, much more photogenic. All right, so here they're making a giant ball of water. So there's a drink bag, and there's water on the inside and a straw. He's squeezing the bag, and he's making a big ball of water. Why? Because he's a guy. <laughs> so now we're putting more water into the ball. You see the little balls moving around. And now he's taking a GoPro camera and shoving it in the ball. Why? Yeah, right. And if you ever wondered, what it looks like from inside a ball of water looking out, here's what it is. So that guy that's grinning right there, he's the commander of the Artemis I crew. But I show you this because see the way the water sticks to his hands? That's surface tension. And that's going to be important when we get to how you take a bath in space. All right, so here's the way we drink. We, the food on board, we have no refrigerator, so it's, you can't cook. You can't keep anything refrigerated and you can't cook it. So it's all been cooked, freeze-dried, vacuum-packed, and here's the way you do your drinks. So there are these bags here. It says orange, orange juice, and it's got an orange powder in it. I don't think it's tang, but orange powder. And then you basically um, put water in it from a water dispenser. Sometimes the guys like to drink directly from the water dispenser. And then you mush it around and you can get hot drinks and cold drinks you put in your straw. And then everything else is either thermostabilized, meaning it's stable on the shelf and you, you just heat it up, um, or uh, vacuum packed. And you take those little vacuum packed um, packages here and you stick them in the water dispenser and you fill them up with the prescribed amount of water. Then there's a little heater that just heats it up. You don't have a knife and a fork, you have spoons. And so you cut the top off of that, and then you can dig into those packages with your spoon. So here in the back, you see all these, these little bottles here. That's the liquid salt and the liquid pepper and the, and the liquid condiments. Think about salt and pepper floating without any gravity. This is the Russian food. Half the food on space station is, is US food. The other half is Russian, yum. Here's the perfect space food, peanut butter and honey, um, no crumbs. So you have to be very careful about the food that you eat that you're not putting any crumbs out there. This is a piece of meat. So the meat is in this package. It's been thermostabilized. It's, you heat it, it's already cooked. And so you eat it. I, do you still eat those push-up popsicles? You know? All right, so this is like a push-up pop. You basically cut the top off. You squeeze the bottom, the meat, squeeze the meat out. You can chew on it and then and it's got a little salt container right next to it. And tortillas, this is the bread product that we have on space. Here's a crew having, making pizza. Right, so what is that? So they've taken tortillas, and then they've taken some squeezed tube of, of like tomato sauce, and then they've sliced up a piece of cheese, and they call it pizza. So that's how you cook in space. If you've ever been to a museum and had astronaut ice cream, nobody eats that. <laughs> I highly recommend you don't eat it either. Anyway, we don't have astronaut ice cream. We get the real stuff. And so if they are sending up um, experiments in a freezer, which they do fly occasionally, then, or they send up a freezer to bring home experiments, then they usually pack the freezer full of ice cream so that the crew can get real ice cream. On board space station, a crew will spend anywhere from three to six to eight to nine, ten months on a year on board. And every few months, a cargo vehicle arrives with supplies. But that's the only time the crew gets to see fresh food. 
you know, we're sort of spoiled here. You want fresh food, vegetables, you know, go to the market and there it is. But you don't get that on a space station. And so whenever a cargo vehicle arrives, they always send fresh food for the crew. And imagine if you haven't seen anything fresh in months. You might want to just smell it before you, you eat it. And then when the fresh food arrives, then the, the meals get really interesting because you, now you have onions and tomatoes and things that can make it interesting. Here's how you eat your M&Ms in space. This is the NASA High Tech Trash Compactor. And what do you do with your trash? We don't throw the trash away. Um, no one comes to collect it twice a week. And so all the trash goes in a bag and then it's compressed really tight. And so this is the human trash compactor here. And then you wait for the cargo vehicle to show up. You offload all the good stuff, you fill up the cargo vehicle with all your trash, and then it departs and it burns up. So you have to live with your trash. So you have to be very careful how you manage that. Exercise is important in the absence of gravity. Your body works just fine, but your muscles can begin to atrophy. And you're fine while you're in space, but when, when you come back to Earth, now, you know, gravity is heavy. And so the crew on board space station exercises two hours every day. One way to do it is on this bicycle ergometer. He's basically belted into a platform um, and then he's got his, his shoes clipped into those pedals. You can dial a resistance into that box and pedal against it. We have a treadmill that is into the floor. She's wearing a harness that holds her down, bungees her down to the tread and the tread runs and, um, and you run on the treadmill. And then we have a resistive device that basically by being strapped to it, when you push up, it pushes down and you can do all of the resistive kind of work that you can do in a gym on this device. So two hours every day, the crew exercises. Here is a soccer game, proving why astronauts are not professional soccer players. Now that's a good goal. And then here's a move you wish you could see in soccer. It just looks so dramatic. Yeah, it's cool. Um, here's movie night. So now the, the um, Hollywood sends first run movies up to the crew. So they get to watch it, sometimes before the families do. It's not like they have a lot of time, but occasionally they get some time off. And so here they're watching probably Top Gun on a, on a sheet that's stretched out and they've got all their snacks and drinks in there having movie night. Um, there's some instruments, you can take some instruments on board. Guitar is easy to play because you're holding it, you don't have to you know, hold yourself down. Um, pipes are easy and this guy right here playing the drum, that is the um, waste management system fecal collection container. That's an empty one. It, it's got better sound when it's empty. Here's how you take a bath. Remember the ball of water? Well, you put the ball of water on you. And the surface tension, like you saw from his hands, allows the water to stick. So you spread the water around. Then you take soap, which is a, a liquid soap, and you soap yourself with a washcloth. And then you put on another ball of water and a towel, and you wipe that off. And so you do one section at a time, and that's how you take your bath. Shaving is normal. We have electric razors, straight razors. They call it astro shaving gel for shaving cream. Um, cutting your hair. So how do you cut your hair in space? Hair would float around. And so here he's got this vacuum cleaner hose that's connected so that when he cuts hair, it goes right down the hose. Now she, she came from the Italian Space Agency and he was the commander of the space station flight. And she made him go to her hairdresser and learn how to cut hair. And he said that was the scariest thing he did on the entire mission. <laughs> Not everybody cuts their hair. Here's toothpaste. Tooth, brushing, brushing your teeth is normal. You have toothpaste, toothbrush, you brush your teeth, but there's no place to spit. So they tell you you should swallow the toothpaste. I don't know, maybe you guys swallow your toothpaste, but yuck. Here's how you sleep in space. Um, you take your sleeping bag. On the shuttle, we took our sleeping bags and we tied it off to the wall, the floor, the ceiling, wherever you want to sleep that night. And you get in and you zip it up and you take those blue straps, which are Velcro, and you stretch them across you and it's like being tucked in. And whatever you don't tuck in floats. 
Now, because there's no gravity, blood doesn't rush out of your hand. It's just weird. You wake up in the morning and there's an arm sort of floating out in front of you. For the pillow, you put your head on this block of foam right here and you Velcro your forehead to it. Now that sounds a little weird, but if you think about it, when you go to sleep at night and you put your head down on the pillow, your neck is at rest. And when your neck is at rest, the rest of you can go to sleep. On space station, everybody has their own little compartment to sleep in, so she's got her sleeping bag in there and, you know, she's cocooned in there and all of her private stuff is in there. And now on space station, because we have so many people, we have more of these sleep bunks lined up. You cannot be claustrophobic and go to space. Okay, here's the bathroom, because everybody wants to know about this. This is a Russian system, so here's the way it works. For liquid, you take this tube, pull this tube off of the wall, you slide your toes under these straps right here, so floating away would be bad, um, and then you hold that tube in the liquid dispensing part of your body and do your thing. And when you do that, it's got a little air that, that sort of sucks it sucks the liquid down into the tube and in the back it's collected in, into a tank where it is reprocessed into drinking water or as the crew likes to say making tomorrow's coffee out of today's coffee <laughs> it's fine nobody has ever gotten sick complained but that's the way it works all right to do something more serious if you have number two to do, you actually lift up the lid, you put a little bag in that hole right there, you put the lid back down, and it's like a diaper genie, it's like a one-shot deal. Um, and then you sit on the, well, you hold yourself down on the, on the seat. Because again, floating away in the middle of this is a bad deal. So you hold yourself down in there and you do what you're gonna do. And then on the sides of the walls, there are wet wipes and dry wipes and disinfectants. And you clean everything up and you put that all in the bag. You close the lid of the bag and you put in a new bag for the next guy. And when, when that can is full of bags, you close it up, replace it, put in a new one and wait for the trash hauler, to wait for the cargo vehicle to show up or use it as a drum, you know, either way. Okay, so here's a tour through Space Station right now. So we're coming from one end flying all the way the length of it to the other. And you can see on the inside of the modules now, there is stuff stuck to the walls everywhere. There's a racks down here, there's a first aid down there. Um, that goes to a window. You can see cameras stuck to the walls wires and cables for experiments everywhere. Um, it's even got instructions of where, you're <clears throat> of where you're going. So this is one of those connecting parts as we're going into the node and when we go into the node, there'll be an up, down, left, right part of it. And you go all the way to the end. We are the maintenance people on board. And so if maintenance has to be done, we have to get under the floor and under the walls and, and do maintenance and we have a tool set. And because everything is floating, each tool has its own individual place in, in a little foam cutout thing. And there are racks of those tools. In fact, everything has Velcro on it. Even your clothes have Velcro on it. So pens and pencils and tape and scissors and all that sort of stuff. There's sort of a work area there where all that stuff is collected. All of our cargo and supplies comes up in these big white bags, and so that's places for collecting those. And the experiments we do on board, I think, are less interesting than your payloads, actually, that you're flying, but we have a number of glove boxes, so we can look at biological experiments, chemical experiments, things with little tiny parts that you don't want to float away. And the coolest experiment is the one that grows plants. It's called veggie. And they grow different kinds of plants in there, and sometimes they get to eat them. Lately, they just grew hatched chilies, and they actually they like to bring all this home for the ground to look at, but they let the crew eat some of them um, before I get to that. Here's the way a, a plant in zero gravity can hold up its own ball of water. Anyway, the hatched chilies made, made um, meals a little bit more interesting because now they could cut those up and add those to their food. And then finally, we are the experiment, understanding how the body performs without any gravity so that we can prepare to do much longer duration missions, moon and Mars and beyond, is important. Um, Kate is, is, was actually really cool. She was sequencing DNA in space. Here is a spacewalk, the uh, EVA. These are the two women, actually, that did the spacewalk. 
And now the suit has no umbilical that connects it. All, everything is, is self-contained in that suit from the backpack, but all spacewalks have a safety wire connected all the time. And on the outside of the space station, there are these handholds, these big gold handholds here, because we knew the crew would be moving around on the outside of the station, going from one end all the way out to the end. And you can see each one of these guys still has a safety tether connected. You can put a platform at the end of the robot arm so that you can take somebody and move them around to a workstation so their feet are restrained and now they can then carry things from place to place while somebody drives them around on, inside on the arm. And each person in the spacesuit is wearing a little backpack so if they become disconnected from their restraint system or they have to do a rescue, they can fly over and, and grab somebody. Nowhere near like what George Clooney did in Gravity, but but it's, that's the system. And of course, taking a selfie. So what you see in here is the lens of the camera, and the camera's wearing its own little spacesuit also. The coolest module on board the space station is the cupola. It's right here, and it's got seven windows in it. And here's what it is inside looking out. And this is everybody's favorite place. It's a great place to, you know, just look outside, um, sit and, and watch the world go by take a selfie. And here's what the world looks like as you're going by. So this is the slice of the Earth that we see as we orbit, and we're orbiting at about 250 miles. That picture that I showed you first at the moon, you know, that's 250,000 miles away. So this is the view that we see. And, you know, parts of the Earth are really stunning. This is a glacier in Alaska. These are ice flows off the northeast part of Russia. This is the Andes in Argentina. The Namibian desert on the west coast of Africa. The uh, Sahara desert. The Australian desert. All the deserts are slightly different colors. The Grand Canyon. Some parts are recognizable. This is Florida, of course. This is the boot of Italy. And you know, you look down and you think, well, well, you know, look at all this cool dirt. Where are the people? Well, there are the people. Here's what it looks like Italy at night. In the, the night pictures that I show you, there's this blue line sort of right across the top. That's the top of the atmosphere. So all the air we breathe is underneath of that blue line. And we we are flying about right here relative to the atmosphere. So we're not very far off the Earth at all. Here's the Great Lakes. All right, and so here, north is over on this side. We've got uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, Sheboygan, Fond du Lac, Green Bay. All right, now north is on the other side here. And so here's Milwaukee and Sheboygan right here. And here's Lake Winnebago. <clears throat> this is Milwaukee. I, didn't, I, knew, I knew most of the states that you come from, but I didn't know your city. So I just sort of grabbed something from every state. Here's Chicago. I did hear you yell out for Chicago. Here's Chicago at night. One of my favorite cities because it's all lined up in straight lines. Um, let's see, this is Detroit. Oh, yay. All right, here's uh, Topeka, Kansas. Des Moines, Iowa. Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. Washington, D.C. At, at night. Or as they say, the 17 square mile logic free zone. Baltimore. Uh, and now we'll move farther east. So here's the Great Lakes up here, and then here's the whole eastern seaboard. So we've got, here's Long Island here with New York, and going all the way up into Cape Cod, and there is Cape Cod. Here's New York City and Central Park right here, and the city that never sleeps, there's New York at night. Um, here's the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and these are the two launch pads where we launched the shuttle and now where um, SpaceX launches and where Artemis will launch. And here is the landing strip right here where the shuttle landed after its missions. 
This is south of Florida. This is the Caribbean waters, and really there's no water on the planet that looks quite like the waters of the Caribbean. Traveling around the world now, this is Tokyo, which I think is the brightest point of light that I've seen. And this is Bangkok right here, and all these green lights that you see are fishing boats. Here is the Nile, right here, a very famous um, piece of real estate. And here is the Nile at night. We travel around the Earth once every 90 minutes, so 16 times a day we go around the Earth. And every astronaut who has ever, ever flown has come back and said the same thing. As you go around the Earth, you don't see the lines and the borders that separate the countries. We're sort of predisposed to putting lines and borders in places by the way we learn geography, but you don't see lines and borders that separate things. Sadly, well, before I get to that, here is, uh, these are the pyramids, right, it's outside of Cairo. But sadly, what we do see are man-made borders. This, this line right here is the lighted border between India and Pakistan. So borders are things that we impose here on the planet. Um, here's a hurricane, so we get to see nature and the things that it does. Uh, this is a thunderstorm. And those white flashing lights, those are thunderstorms as you look down on them. The orange light is a city light. As I said, we go around the Earth 16 times a day, so for 45 minutes we see the sun up, 45 minutes we see the sun down. And that line between daylight and night is called the Terminator line. And so 16 times a day we see the sun rise and the sun set. And because we are flying at a high inclination here, we get to see the uh, aurora, both the southern and the northern lights. And if you let your eye adapt and you look out into the dark of space, you can even see the arm of the Milky Way that we're in. So these are all real pictures taken by a crew. That's the space station as it looks today. The Chinese also now have a space station in orbit, and this is what theirs look like. You can see it looks very similar to ours, except it doesn't have as much stuff in it yet. But they have crew on board, and they have been exchanging crews. They just took a cargo uh, vehicle yesterday. They've been doing their own spacewalks. Now we're in the commercial world, and SpaceX is the name that everybody knows, and this is their Dragon on Falcon, and this is how we're getting American astronauts into space now. This is the way they look inside so you can see it's a little bit more roomy and and you know it looks real cool but I'll tell you right now it's the same technology that everybody else is flying that we have flown for 50 or 60 years it just looks smoother this is their rocket launch and they fly both cargo and crew to the International Space Station and sometimes they've got them both docked at the same time this is the way their capsule looks when they come back now they refurbish it and they refly those same capsules again because it's got the same kind of tiles on it. Boeing is also getting ready to fly crew. They have flown an uncrewed flight um, with a launch on an Atlas rocket. This is what their capsule looks like coming to the International Space Station. This is the crew that they flew, Rosie the, the something or other. Um, it was just an instrumented dummy. But the next flight, hopefully in June, will carry crew. And they land on land on airbags. So this was what they, they look like after their first landing. Where we're going now in the future is to the moon. And in order to do that, now this is the only non-real picture that we've got it. NASA is going to build, going to build a gateway. And it's going to be 5,000 miles away from the moon. And then we're going to fly, going to, this Orion capsule and connect to it. And then we're going to get in another vehicle and go land on the moon. That's the plan. Um, the way the crew gets there on Orion is with this SLS rocket, which has flown successfully its first flight. So it did launch. It had an Orion capsule on top of it that went beyond Earth to the moon. So there it is between the Earth and the moon that looped all the way around the moon and came back. And the next flight, we will put a crew of four on there and do that exact same flight. That capsule lands 
um, under parachutes in the water, and here's what it looked like after it landed. These orange bags that you see in here, those are called uprighting bags. So if it should land and be upside down, those bags inflate and that pops it right side up again. This is what SpaceX is trying to fly now. This is the Starship. And so this top part here is the part would, that would ultimately go to land on the moon. And so they just, they just launched it. And it successfully launched, and it did not successfully fly. Um, but that's their plan. So that's the plan. And then why go to the moon in the first place, right? Well, in order to go to the moon, which only is a week away in order to do that mission, teaches us how to do these things again so that we can go on to Mars. Mars is a multi-year mission. You can't just loop around and come back if something goes wrong, like you can at the moon. This is a real picture of Mars. But it would take you, when Mars is as close to Earth as it's going to be, happens every two years or so. And so you launch to get to Mars when it's as close as it will be to Earth, and it takes six to eight months in order to get there. And then you have to wait either three months or a year and a half before you can come home again. So understanding how to operate away from the Earth, which we practice on the moon, is what you do before you go to Mars. We have ro rovers on Mars. This is the Spirit Opportunity rover that was on Mars. And just to show you for scale, here's what it looks like. This is that Spirit Opportunity. Next to two guys at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, they have sort of a Mars rock field kind of thing. So, you know, what we're flying on Mars right now is the size of a smart car, and that's it. Before we can actually go to Mars with, with enough uh, fuel and, and food and habitats and things, we got to do better than that. The one we've got on Mars right now is this Curiosity rover, which again, you can see for scale, there's the guy. It's not very much bigger, but it landed under parachutes. And here are pictures that these rovers have been taken from the Martian surface. This is that little helicopter that's been flying, and it's got, what, 30, 40, 50 flights on it now? Mars' atmosphere is very thin. There is a, a third of the gravity, and it's a carbon dioxide atmosphere, but it's, it's got a little bit of atmosphere, which the moon does not have, so it will support a flight like that. And we do that so that we can one day go beyond Mars. Mars is about as far as we can get right now with our current technology. So somebody, one of you guys, has to invent a better technology, please, for propulsion, and then we can go beyond um, Mars, the inner planets, and look at the outer planets, Jupiter, or the moons of Jupiter, which are probably more interesting, or Saturn. If we were at Saturn and we were looking back on the Earth where that arrow was pointing, that little blue dot, is what the Earth would look like as seen from Saturn. Imagine how you'd feel if, if this was the view you had. And then beyond our solar system into the rest of the galaxy and beyond our galaxy into other galaxies. So these are pictures from Webb and from Hubble Telescope showing different galaxies. And nebula, where new stars are being born. This is a picture from the Webb Telescope, and it covers the amount of sky covered by a grain of sand. Each point of light in this is not a star. Each point of light is a galaxy. Wrap your brain around that. In a grain of sand, all of those things right there are galaxies. And each galaxy has billions of stars with, with billions of planets. So when people ask me why would we ever go to space in the first place, and I know you guys all know the right answer, you look at this picture and you go, because we have to. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, question and answer time. We have about 20 minutes, so we can have a whole bunch of questions. So if anyone's got a question, raise your hand. I'll come to you. We'll go around. Yes, sir, come on over here. Come on over to the end.
I, uh, I have a question. Um, I bet, like, I was asking myself, uh, the YouTuber Mark Rober, didn't he make, like, one of the Rovers? I'm sorry, say that again? Did uh, one of the YouTube, one of the most famous YouTuber like he said that he used to be like a engineer for like one of the Mars rovers? Oh, first of all, I don't know anything about YouTubers, but a lot of people that are doing space, you know, documentary things used to work for Jet Propulsion Labs in other places, so it could be. I, w I wanted to ask: Did you see um, Scott Kelly in his gorilla costume? Okay, I still didn't hear that. Did I see who? Did you see Scott Kelly in a gorilla costume? Not in person. <laughs> That's... <laughs> There's one in the back there. Does being in space stunt your growth? I'm sorry, I still can't. Does being in space stunt your growth? Does it stunt your growth? Does it stunt your growth? No, it actually makes you taller. <laughs> right? So those of us that are vertically challenged, you know, I thought, how cool, I'm going to be taller. And the reason that is, is because without, when you're, when you're standing here in gravity, gravity holds you in compression. So it takes all your little spinal segments and, and keeps them compressed on the discs. And when you are without gravity, it allows you to stretch. So you and I get about an inch taller. The tall guys get but they get taller also. So I'm still the shortest one in the room. And the same thing happens if you, when you wake up in the morning, you're taller than you were when you went to bed. And as you walk around, you smush back down again because gravity compresses you. So without any gravity, you're actually taller. And the, the, the weird thing about it is, is that your muscles in your back like to be in compression. They don't like to be stretched. And so you end up with a backache. And so everybody sleeps with their knees sort of Velcroed up around their chest to sort of relieve their back pain. Um, what is the communication like from Mars and, or from space and Earth? So <clears throat> while we're in orbit at 250 miles, communication is almost instantaneous. Um, when you get to the moon, there might be a few second delay. And when you go all the way to Mars, depending on how close Mars is, it could be anywhere from 20 to 40 minutes in delay. And so when the Jet Propulsion Lab is sending commands to those rovers on Mars, they send the command and then they wait, you know, an hour and a half to get a feedback. So, yeah. And then the farther you go right now, the longer the communication is. So somebody needs to invent a better communication service like they do in space movies so that you can go instantaneous. <clears throat> Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Um, how many times have you been to space? Sorry if you already said it. Uh, five, five shuttle flights. <laughs> what was the coolest thing you saw in space? Oh, wow. The coolest thing I saw? You, you know, I have to think that the Earth was the coolest thing I saw. Because, you know, how much traveling do you really get to do? And now you get to travel around the world every 90 minutes, you know, and see, when there are no clouds, things that you only see in, in pictures. So that was the coolest thing, I thought. What did it feel like re-entering in the space shuttle? Like, did it kind of almost feel like a normal plane or...? Oh, good question. Yeah, what did it feel like coming back in the space shuttle? All right, so imagine that I'm floating, right? You're floating. And as you come in in the space shuttle, gravity is very slowly picking up. And so you're sitting there and you realize it feels like your foot's caught under something and it's just now hard to lift your leg up. Just a little smidge of gravity. And then you, your head start knocking down because your neck is in and then you can hold a pencil up and you see the pencil very slowly float back down again so in shuttle it was very mild we basically picked up maybe we came to one just a little bit more than one g and we landed now in a capsule it's a completely different story in a capsule they come in and they they get four or five g's and so that's and it's going this way so it's like five gorillas are sitting on your chest and, and you only get that for a minute or so, but it's, it's a rude awakening. And then, of course, you crash into the ground, and, and there's that. So the capsule's landings are much, much more dynamic than the shuttle. 
Okay, before I forget, um, Ms. Ivins will be signing her photographs that each one of you have got today in your packets. She'll be off on the side after lunch to make sure, so you can go and talk with her some more this afternoon. Sir, come over and so this doesn't NASA have a simulation for what it would be like on Mars? NASA doesn't have any simulators that do zero gravity or any gravity. Now we have some little um, lunar gravity simulator, but you're in a weighted kind of thing. But we don't have simulators yet that look at that. We've got the rock field at the Jet Propulsion Lab. You know, there's some visual simulators of that, that use satellite data to look at the terrain kind of thing. But we don't have any real vehicles to practice in just yet. But when we do, then we build simulators for that. Did it startle you to see how much light pollution was on the Earth? Like at night? No, oh, light pollution, you know, I sort of expected to see that. I mean, it's the same kind of thing that you see when you're flying in an airplane at night and you look down and you see city lights, you just see more of it. Um, the birds don't like the light pollution, but yeah. What was the best experiment that you did or your favorite experiment? Ooh, favorite experiment, hmm. Um, I, I guess the one that, that I actually was fascinated by is a thing called protein crystal growth. And so if you look at um, something like a virus, it is a protein crystal. And when you look at that um, under microscopes on the earth, you can see the amount of detail like say, that's a tree. I mean, you know, that's how detailed it is. But if you can grow that crystal without any gravity, and gravity induces things like uh, sedimentation and that kind of thing, but if you can grow it without any, you can now get a pure crystal and you can say, oh, that's a maple tree, you know, that kind of thing. And then you bring those crystals back and you look at x-ray, you know, you looking at it and, and, and you can tell better what that is. And so if you can understand how that protein actually is constructed, now you can design a drug that would allow you to not wipe out the whole organ, but just target that protein's ability to grab onto things. And, and I always thought that was gonna be a useful experiment. Sadly, they were all proprietary, so we never got to learn what any of the data would show. Does the gravity in space affect your body in a negative way? The lack of gravity affects your body in, in some ways. It's got um, short-term effects. Um, so now that I've had no gravity, the thing that keeps you standing upright, so if you, if you stand up and you close your eyes, you'll feel your body sort of swaying a little bit and it'll, it'll adjust itself because inside your ear is this little three-axis gyro and so it senses if you're, if you're going pitching or rolling or yawing and it corrects you, your vestibular system. That's why you get dizzy when you spin on the earth. Now if without any gravity, it, it doesn't work. And that's why you can spin all day long and, and never get dizzy. But now when you come back and there's gravity, it's really sensitive. So if I turn my head very fast, I fall over. So learning to, to navigate again and get your vestibular system back used to gravity, that's probably the hardest part in coming back. Um, if I was to toss up one of the balls of water what would, or catch one, what would happen? Would it like break apart or would it stick to my hand? Well, it depends on, yes, <clears throat> it would stick to your hand. It would, it, you, you ever seen a lava lamp? Okay, it's like the, the stuff inside the lava lamp, you know, it <clears throat> sort of undulates a little bit. If you smash it, it makes a bunch of little balls. And when the little balls touch each other, they join up to become a bigger ball. So you, you can't really toss it because you can't get it off your hand, you know, but you can squeeze it out of, a, out of the straw. All right, right, oops, I have one question for you from our dinner last night. I think it was a great conversation. What do you get for personal items that you can take on a flight? On the space shuttle, we got to bring 10 personal items that fit in a little bag. That was it. On Space Station, they get a little bit more. They get about, you know, a, a decent size amount. And everybody brings different things that were personal items. Um, you know, some people bring pictures and they bring uh, books and they bring things like that. I have a friend who brought um, electrical components so that he could build things in space. 
Um, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question. When the capsule comes down and, you know, it burns up in the atmosphere, you say that certain companies reuse that capsule. Would any technology be compromised within the capsule itself then? Or would it be... On the, on the inside? Yes. Yeah, no, the inside is fine. Um, it's just the outside shell of it. Now, some of those capsules were designed to crush when they land. So they have on the, on the, on the heat shield, which is the thing that <clears throat> protects it when it comes to the atmosphere, then they drop the heat shield off and it exposes like those airbag kind of things. Um, some of it builds crushable structure. So basically when it lands, it absorbs the shock by crushing the bottom of it. And in the Soyuz, what happens is you're, where, you're in a seat that's molded to you, custom molded to your body. And you're sitting, you know, sort of in a fetal position. And it's got a little spring on it. And right before it senses the ground, it pops the spring up. So you go like this. And so you're not taking that in your spine. But those kind of things either have to be replaced or you have to get a whole new vehicle because the, the structure is designed to take the load. Um, what was your favorite food while you were in space? Favorite food? Probably anything that was chocolate. Um, so just so, uh, what is the experiments you think they're planning to do on Mars? I think what they're trying to do on Mars is look for water. And the, experiment, the experiments would be, you know, literally trying to get water out of wherever they find it and then purifying it and testing it, and then probably trying to grow things that you can eat. I mean, it's, it's sort of like the Martian with his potatoes, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, that's what I think I would do. Because it's all the same people for extended period of time on the ISS, would people get sick or no if there's not already someone who was sick that came? Uh, yeah, if you, if you didn't bring it, you're not going to get it. You know, you need to be exposed to some sort of virus or bacteria in order to, to be sick. Now, you could be sick because something natural, like you end up with an appendicitis or a heart problem. But if you're not predisposed to those things, then it's sort of unlikely. And as a result, they put crews in quarantine for weeks before they fly to keep them from being exposed to anything that they could carry. But if in that closed environment, you came to space with a cold, we're all getting your cold. Ma'am, I have a two-part question. What was the most stressful thing that you and the crew in any of your space flight experienced and how did you deal with it? And the second one is, was there a crisis that you had to handle, a failure, which then you had to recover from? So the most stressful thing that I did on any of my flights, well, there are two stressful things. After my first flight, I was the, <laughs> I had the longest hair that had ever flown in space. Um, and by the time when I got home, there was a request for me to be on the David Letterman show. And that was the most terrifying thing I have ever done in my life. Um, on, in flight, the most terrifying thing I did is that I had to install that U.S. laboratory module. And so we carry this thing in the cargo bay, and it's 48 feet long. It weighs 32,000 pounds. I have to pick it up with a robot arm. It's got one inch of clearance on the side. When we're connected to space station, all I see is space station out here. I got these 1970s TV cameras in the back. I got to flip this thing over and plug it in. It's $1.4 billion, one of a kind. And if I screw this up, I break the space station forever. No pressure there. So, yeah, and I trained that and I mean, I, there was at the, at, in that time, this is in 2001, 2000, um, M&M's had released the orange M&M, and he walked around saying, I'm doomed, I'm doomed. I had a t-shirt that said, I'm doomed. My second question, a crisis that we came out of. Well, we didn't have any that you make movies of, you know, every, but there's, there's a sort of a crisis on every flight. Um, sometimes the bathroom didn't work, and then we had to fix that. That could have been a crisis. Um, <laughs> We had one where there was, a, there was a shuttle flight 
right before ours where the crew was trying to do a spacewalk and they couldn't get the hatch, the airlock hatch open. And that airlock had two hatches, one on the inside, one on the outside. And we keep the outside one closed when we're not doing a spacewalk, but the inside one we opened to go in there and we couldn't keep it open. You know, it opened and it wouldn't latch and we didn't call the ground because they had just worked a whole flight with a hatch problem and we thought this is going to be a nightmare. We did have one on a, a tether flight. <clears throat> we were deploying a, a, a tether basically and, and the, in the science behind that is, is if you take a conducting material like copper wire and you move it very fast, 17,500 miles per hour, through a magnetic field which surrounds the earth, you generate electricity. And so we were going to unroll 20 miles of electrical cable at the end of a little satellite and prove this experiment. And it gets out 800 feet and it stops. And now here's all this you know, wavy tether, and we had trained for that, but you don't expect to see that, and boink, this thing stops, and it just becomes a flail on the inside. And um, I was recording audio at the time for an IMAX movie, and I, I will not tell you the things that ended up on that, <laughs> but, but you can imagine. Um, and it became one of those, not quite Apollo 13 things, but the ground had to figure out how to get it back in again. And we did. And it was a happy ending to the story, but, but that was one of those things. What is something you hated doing on space that you don't have to do on Earth? What did you hate doing in space that you didn't have to do on Earth? Cleaning the bathroom. <laughs> All right, I get the last question. We're going to wrap this up. You have movie night on the International Space Station. Do they avoid movies like The Martian, Aliens? No. No. Things like that, all that gets sent up? No, in fact, on, on my um, third flight, we were 14 days. And so in a 14-day flight on shuttle, they gave you a half a day off. What are you going to do a half a day off? Wash your car? I mean, you can't, it, it's not like you have something to do. And so we brought movies. And this is back in the days with high eight tapes kind of thing. And so it was me and four guys, and they picked the movies. And so what did they pick? Alien 2. <laughs> and Terminator. So yeah, no, there's no avoidance of it. You can't run, but you can't hide from those movies. Absolutely. Oops. All right, well, thank you very much. Let's hear it from Ms. Ivins. So just a reminder, she will be signing your photographs for you this afternoon. She'll be over there by Barb and Carol wave at the crowd. She'll be over at that desk this afternoon after lunch. So we are done for this morning. If you want to head out and get your lunches, but please be back here at 1 o'clock so we can kick off the afternoon activities. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.